Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest exemplifies the meaning of the word survivor. Her life was forever changed on the night of August 28, 1997. She and her boyfriend, who were 20-year-old university students in Lexington, Kentucky, were savagely attacked by a monstrous serial killer who tied them up, bludgeoned her boyfriend to death, stabbed her in the neck, raped her, beat her, and left her for dead. The attacker, whose name I will not dignify on this show, was known as the railroad killer because his victims were usually located near train tracks. Before finally being arrested two years later, he killed 23 people in the United States and Mexico. He was executed in Texas in 2006 by lethal injection. Our guest is the only known survivor of his attacks. In the 24 years since the attack, she's dedicated her life to supporting victims of violent crimes and educating communities on how to prevent and combat violence. She's written an unforgettable book entitled Soul Survivor, the inspiring true story of coming face to face with the infamous railroad killer. The book illustrates how the most profound and horrific tragedy, pain and grief, can be channeled into something positive and constructive for other people. I'm truly honored to welcome Holly K. Dunn to our show. Holly, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. Holly, what made you decide to write this book? You know, I had wanted to write a book for a long time. I had known that my story was unique. I seeked out books like I had written, like I wrote during my healing process, I wanted to hear from survivors. I wanted to hear from people who had been through something like I had been through. I wanted to know that I wasn't crazy in my healing. So I seeked out books like I wrote, and I knew that I wanted to give that to someone else if, if I could. If, if someone else could get a hold of my book and get through their own situation, then that's that was the purpose. And so I've known for a long time, it just took me a long time to get into the right mindset into my, and, and into the right place in my healing process that I was able to do the work to write the book. Is it fair to say that you wanted people to know that it's possible to heal from even the worst nightmare and to go on to have a meaningful and happy life? Definitely, you know, I, I say that, bad things can happen, but there's life after it does that you can get through anything. You find strength when you never knew you had strength until, and until you're put into the situation to uh, need that strength. You don't even know, know you have it, you know, and I, I hope that my book gets into the hands of people, survivors that need to hear the story, but then all of us have been through something hard, some, some terrible times in our lives. And I hope that my book can be inspirational to say, you know, you can get through anything. You know, Holly, many survivors of violent crimes want to put it behind them and never talk about it again. But you decided to speak openly and publicly about the attack. It took a lot of courage to do that because every time you tell your story, I would imagine it takes you to such a dark place, but you're willing to do that to help other people. And I think that's truly remarkable. Well, you know, I, what I found and what's amazing is that by telling my story, it was healing for me. So by getting the words outside of me, they lost their power over me. By getting the story outside of me, the story lost its power over me and I became powerful over it. So I started to realize that early on when I was telling my story just to friends and family. So I knew that telling the story was, was a key in my healing. So that's why I, I keep telling it. That's why I, I keep talking. I, I want to uh, continue healing and it's, it's put me on a great path in my life. So it's, I, I feel like I did something right. And if it was the one thing I told my story as many times as I could. You know, Holly, you're an incredible person for many reasons. And the first thing that amazed me about you is this. You witnessed your boyfriend, Chris Mayer, being bludgeoned to death with a 50-pound rock. You were bound, gagged, raped, and beaten to within an inch of your life. Your scalp was split in multiple places. Your cheeks were lacerated. You had a fractured eye socket and a broken jaw. How did you, while enduring the most horrific attack imaginable, how did you have the presence of mind to memorize the attacker's face so you could help the police sketch artist draw his face? 
You know, I, I don't know where that came from. I mean, I definitely knew that if I had, if I lived through it, because I mean, there were times when I thought I was going to die, but I thought, you know, if I do live through this, I want to remember your face. And I don't know really what made me think to do that, but you know, it, it, it was instinct. I think, I mean, it was just what, you know, when you go into survival mode, you don't know how you're going to become. And I think you just do what it takes to survive. And that's, that's for me what it took. Well, I think it's remarkable. You wrote that the rape was far more traumatic for you than being beaten almost to death. Many people might find that hard to understand. Can you explain why you felt that way? Well, my mind was amazing. It let me heal from things as I could. So first I dealt with my boyfriend, Chris dying. Then I dealt with myself almost dying. And the last thing I dealt with, the last thing that my mind let me deal with was the rape. And the reason I think it was so difficult was that it was the last thing I dealt with. So I had gotten on a great path in my healing on everything else, but then I had to deal with this rape that was completely separate. And I just didn't realize that there were so many components of what I was, what I was healing from. And I think that it was just the, I don't know that, you know, that it's such an intimate act that it's, it's such a, it's such a thing that you have to, you don't know how to heal from it. You don't know how to go on with your life from it. You don't know what you should do next. I think it just takes talking and knowing other people that have been through it and, and reading as much as you can. And, you know, for me, a support group was really important. I needed to know that other people had had this happen and what did, what, you know, am I going crazy? No, other people have been through this too. You know, it, there is strength in numbers. There is strength in people that have been through something you like you've been through. And I think that that's really what I, I found in the beginning was that those people that could help me were people that had uh, been through something like I had and, and the need to talk about it again. I was surprised that when you were in the hospital immediately following the attack, a hospital social worker told your family not to talk to you about the attack as it would just upset you, but you wanted to talk about it. So I'm going to ask you, what advice do you have for hospital counselors when dealing with victims of violence? Well, I think that times have really changed. You know, that was 24 years ago. And, and I think that times have really changed and they've gotten a lot better. You know, I, I just think people didn't know, know what to say. I mean, nobody, I think at the hospital had probably been through a situation like I had been through. They were afraid that the attacker would come back. They were afraid that he knew who I was, you know, that my name had been released or that somebody knew my name, that they were trying to protect me. I don't think they necessarily did anything wrong. It just felt very strange to tell my family that they shouldn't talk about it. And, but I get why they said it. They wanted me to bring it up. They wanted me not to be re-victimized. And I, and so I kind of, I have, you know, empathy now for why they did that. I just think that you can, it, it can help and kind of fluidly, you can kind of let it happen. You don't have to try to dictate the situation. You don't have to try to tell people what they should be feeling and what they shouldn't. I think you just kind of have to let it happen as it's going to. You wrote about the way people treated you after the attack and how much effort it took for you to make them feel comfortable with being around you by reassuring them that you were okay when you really were not okay. That must have been very draining. It was. I mean, you know, it was it was hard to put on a strong face and to to make people believe that I I and I I was being strong. I mean, now I realize that I was actually I had a lot of strength, but it just, I had more healing to do. And that, that was, you know, a, how it needed to happen. I, and I think, again, our minds are amazing. They let those things happen as they, as they can. They don't put, my mind didn't put too much on me at the same time. And, you know, I just think, I think it all happened like it was supposed to. You gave some very good advice, Holly, in the book uh, to friends and family dealing with this situation. You wrote, and I'm going to quote here, I've come to understand that there isn't much one can say to someone who's been through severe trauma or tragedy. Sometimes just being present in the pain is enough. Holly, I think that's very helpful advice to people who don't know how to comfort a loved one who's been victimized. 
Yeah, it, it's it's really hard because you want to fix, you want to help them however you can. And a lot of times there's nothing you can do. You know, I tell people that the one thing that they can do that they can feel like they can have power over it because that's really what it's about. They want to feel like they have some kind of control over the situation is that they can inform themselves as to what resources are in their community. So, you know, know where this where this person could go to get help if if they so chose to get that help. Because there might come a point where they ask you, if you are that listening ear for them, if you're that person that they wanna talk to, you can inform yourself as to what might help them in the future. And I think that gives you a little bit of control that you feel like you can help when you're needed. And, and you know, they may never ask, but now you have that information for others if they should need it. And, you know, it's good to know what resources are available in your community. Oh, absolutely. Now, you were extremely nervous about making contact with Chris's family after the tragedy. Why? You know, I had a lot of survivor's guilt. I felt like they would not like me because I had survived and their son hadn't, that there was, it wasn't fair. I mean, you know, why did I survive and he didn't? And, you know, that it was just a lot of survivor's guilt. And I had to work through that. And, you know, it was amazing when I did meet them. They, you know, gave me great big bear hugs and told me how proud they were of me. And, you know, that couldn't have meant more because it was, it, it, ju it just, reinforced that they were such great people and that they wanted the best for me. And, you know, that's all I needed to know. And then the, it kind of helped with that survivor's guilt. And I didn't feel that anymore. Yeah, you finally met Chris's family in person when they filmed their interview on America's Most Wanted. And since then, you've become close with them. I think that's so lovely. They are. They're like my third family. I, I tell my husband all the time, I say, you know, I've got I've got your, your family and my family, and I've got Chris's family and they're my third family. And, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful to have them. I, I don't really know what I would do without them. They're, they're, uh, you know, amazing people. And they're a part of my life now that they, they will always be. Holly, you're a very spiritual person. I have to ask you after going through that monstrously brutal attack, how did you manage to maintain your faith in God? Well, my faith was rocked. I mean, I, I have been through the, uh, like anger with God and, you know, I think it, I think that's normal. I think it's normal to go through that anger and to feel that, that, you know, maybe your faith did not uphold itself for you. I truly held on to it barely. I mean, I, it was, it was tough to get back to it, but God definitely showed me signs that he was there and that he was never left my side. And that's what's amazing is that when you're looking for the faith and how the faith followed you and how it, it helped you, then you can find it. it. It just takes a little effort from you. And I think that's, that's what it took. And when I did find it again, I mean, it became stronger than ever because I was for sure that I did not do this alone. I am not here on this earth by my own actions it was it was a, it was god that that saved me do you believe in destiny that everything happens for a reason and that things are meant to be i do to a degree i mean i don't think that god wants anything bad to happen to us i believe that you know there is there is another you know evil out there that's happening and that evil we can't stop it god can't even stop it but you know you can get that i think most people in the world are good i think that the evil is is out there but it's smaller and the good will always out out when the the evil it's like my little my kids stories of you know that the the good always wins and i really believe that that's true in life too it just might take a lot of time and some effort by us to uh, make that happen. I want to ask you about counseling. You wrote that the first counselor you went to was a disappointment. What advice do you have for counselors who are trying to help sexual assault victims? You know, I think it, it just to be empathetic is very important. I think not reading from a book. I think trying to be more empathetic and listen as much as you can to the person's story. 
you know, I took a very unconventional approach to healing and I think that's what I needed. I think for some people, they can follow a book, follow steps, and that's how they can heal and, and, and do better. And that, that, you know, it's just not the same for everybody. And that makes it really hard for therapists that they, you know, it's, they have to be very adaptable and, and know what a person might need. And just know that just because, you, you know, a therapist doesn't fit with one person, that doesn't mean they're not going to be great for another person. And I, I say that to a lot of people too, that, you know, I believe in therapy. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It, it can help you tremendously, but sometimes you have to go from therapist to therapist to find one that you can trust and feel like that is your person that, that you can talk to. So what was unconventional about your journey to healing? You know, I just didn't, I didn't check out, do check marks. I didn't look in a book and say, I'm in this process now. I'm in this process now. I just lived my life. I wanted to finish school. I wanted to, I, you know, and, and really I banded with Chris's friends. That's what my unconventional approach was to band with Chris's friends, to do things Chris had done to honor his life and, and do feel no things that he had done. And just remember him, remember him with his friends, with his family, remembering him and kind of walking in his footsteps were a great healing process for me, you know, and that's just not, that's not conventional. You wouldn't say, go, go to Maine, go travel to Maine and, and, and walk around and, and see if that, that helps you. It's been a 24 year process. I mean, and that's, what's amazing is that healing never stops. This will never go away. This is always going to be part of my life. And that's okay. I just know that now this is part of my life and that I have control over it and that I am in control and that I'm the one writing the debt. I'm still here writing my future. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's, I'm, I feel so grateful for my second chance at life. I thought your comment in the book about going to support groups for sexual assault survivors was really interesting. You said that when you're attacked by a total stranger, there's not much value in sitting with a group of women who were sexually assaulted by men that they knew because nobody could identify with your story and you really had very little in common with them. I think that's a really important point that you have to find therapeutic avenues that meet your needs. You have to figure out what those needs are. And that's, that's what's hard is that, especially when you're going through healing, you don't know what to even look for. You know, I, when I joined that support group, there just happened to be another girl that had been raped by a stranger that had broken into her, her apartment. And, you know, that's the person that I connected with. And, you know, you don't know you, but you have to, you have to seek out all those avenues of, of healing to know what's going to help you. Because if I had never joined that support group, I never would have met that person. So, you know, just because part of that didn't really help me, one part of that really did. And if I hadn't done it in the first place, I never would have found that person. So, you know, it, it's, it's tough, but you got to figure, you got to figure out what modes of therapy are good for you. If it is support group, support groups, if it is therapy, if it is, you know, talking to a pastor or someone at the church, if it is just talking to a friend, a lot of times your support can just be one person. You know, my support network was enormous. I had the, all these people that were thinking it for me and praying for me and, and sending me good vibes. And, you know, not everybody has that. So if you can just have one person that believes in you, that listens, that is a person that, you know, is in your corner, that can make all the difference. And you may find that in so many different avenues. It's, it's, you just have to seek out what's right for you. Your attacker was featured in an episode of America's Most Wanted, a very important TV show that has helped to locate hundreds of missing children and fugitives. During the airing of the show, their hotline received a phone call from your attacker's cousin, which was pivotal to capturing him. Take us back to July 13th, 1999, when you learned that your attacker was finally arrested. What went through your head? Well, you know, I was actually out, not in the United States. I was uh, in England going to school and I found out about it just like everybody else from television. It wasn't, I, I you know, I was too far away and didn't have access to a phone to find out any other way. And, you know, really what went through my mind was relief 
because I knew that no one else would be killed by him, that his story would at least end there. I did believe that he would, you know, I didn't know if he would spend the rest of his life in jail or if he would get the death penalty. You know, I didn't know what would happen, but I knew that him surrendering and him being, you know, put in jail, that he would not hurt anyone else. And I think that that just gave me a feeling of relief. You testified during the punishment phase of the trial to support the prosecution's request for the death penalty. What was going through your mind when almost three years after the attack, you had to face this monster in a courtroom? So it didn't seem real. I mean, it it was, it, I, I had the hardest time trying to prepare for that day. I was, you know, trying to do a lot of self care, doing breathing exercises, just trying to stay calm, not let my anxiety and my fears like well up in me. But no matter what I did, they did well up. And I mean, it just was, I was fearful. I was angry. You know, all those feelings that I don't want to feel. I, 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 and so it, it, what it did for me was I didn't want to feel them and I was able to compartmentalize them. So I could say, like, my attacker caused all these feelings, right? These fearful, angry, hate, all these feelings that I don't want to be feeling. And he caused them all. So can I just put them with him? And then I'll be okay. So that's what I tried to do. I tried to compartmentalize and put them all with him and just get through what I was going to do. And, you know, it, it did help to actually be able to talk through my testimony. Well, I'm going to quote something to you that you wrote in the book that I found very, very powerful. You said, I can say with full certainty that testifying at the trial was worse than the night of the attack itself. It was worse than being raped. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. That's a very strong statement to make, Holly, that the trial was even worse than the attack. Why did you feel that way? Well, you know, at that point, I had been healing for a couple of years and I had been working hard on my healing. And all of a sudden I get subpoenaed to, to have to testify against this guy who tried to ruin my life. And I think it was the fact that I was working so hard to try to get back to a normal life. And then he pulls me back again to this horrible night. And it's like, it's got to happen all over again. It's a re-victimization, you know, it, it, and I wouldn't take it back. I mean, I wanted that day in court. I wouldn't, I, I would go through it again. Like I wanted that day to be able to say, you did this to me and you deserve to be punished for it. So, I mean, I wanted that day, but you know, that's, it, it was so, so difficult. And I mean, I went through a nervous breakdown the night before I was screaming, crying. I couldn't sleep. I mean, I don't, th- I think if my family hadn't been there, I don't know if I could have done it. I mean, I don't know if I would have actually shown up to, to, to give my testimony. It was so hard. It, it just, it was the, the hardest part was being in the room with him again. I mean, I, it, he literally gave me anxiety fear and and just made my skin crawl. And and I didn't like even having to be in the room with him again. I was really impressed and inspired by your approach to overcoming tragedy. After the trial and falling in love with your husband, Jacob, you decided simply to have fun. You wrote, some people find it counterintuitive or backward to deal with tragedy and horrible aspects of life by having a good time. But my theme in healing is to find positive ways to cope and engaging in activities and relationships that make me happy. That's remarkable, Holly, because you actually created your own therapy to heal yourself. You know, I I truly believe that your mindset and how you wake up each day can change the course of your day. And, you know, that's what I would do, especially on those hard days. You know, still today, to this day, the anniversary of the attack is a hard day for me. I know it's going to be a bad day. Even 20, this, this past August 28th, to, you know, it was 24 years later. And, you know, I focused on my kids, on my husband, and it wasn't such a bad day. And so, you know, I've just realized that 
by being positive, I have been able to, and I kind of always looking for, you know, making, making lemonade out of lemons. I mean, I, I've kind of always been that person. So, I mean, I just could, I could make, I could make my healing happen because I was choosing something. And, you know, that's what I say all along. I didn't even know what I was choosing. You know, I didn't know that public speaking would come along. I didn't know that a book would come along. I didn't know what was next, but I just kept choosing to do something. It wasn't, I didn't want to crawl in a hole. I didn't want to not face it. I wanted to do something. And, you know, that's what I think has gotten me to where I am today. Holly, you didn't just create lemonade out of a lemon. You made a lemon orchard out of a lemon. And the most inspiring thing about you is the work you've done, speaking, teaching, advocating on behalf of survivors of violent crimes and child abuse. In partnership with the Evansville, Indiana Police Department, you established an advocacy center for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse and neglect. It's called Holly's House, named after you. Can you tell us a bit about it? Sure. Well, Holly's House is a location where victims of intimate crimes, so adult victims and child victims, child victims of abuse and neglect and sexual abuse, and adult victims of domestic violence or sexual assault can come to Holly's House to be interviewed. And the interview is recorded. You know, we want to promote justice, prevent violence, and just support the victim. So we want to be that location where they can come and feel comfortable and be interviewed, but then also help them by providing resources that are available for them to help them in their healing process and, and, and to help them and their families because your families are secondary victims to what happens. So, you know, now we are also able to teach a program where we can try to prevent these crimes from happening. So we try, we teach a program called Think First, Stay Safe, and it's taught to kindergarten through fifth grade children. And it's taught, they're taught the lures of, of how, what predators use to try to victimize them. And so, you know, we're trying to prevent the crimes. We're trying to help the people that have been through them. And then we're trying to promote justice. We're trying to give them, get the perpetrators off of the streets. And that's, you know, it, it's, it's amazing work that Holly's House does. I, I'm not there on a daily basis anymore, but I'm I'm able to know the legacy that it's providing for our community, that it's it's an amazing asset. Well, I'm gonna ask you a big question now. Your attacker was executed by lethal injection on June 27th, 2006. What do you say to people who are opposed to the death penalty? You know, I really believe that people are entitled to their own opinions. And, and so I, I would never try to change anyone's mind. I believe that we all are allowed to believe what we want to, you know, I, I'm, I, I, the reason I believe in the death penalty is that I believe it was the ultimate punishment for my attacker. I believe that that's what he deserved. He had taken so many lives and caused so much damage and that's, you know, and that's what he deserved. And, you know, that's, I think was, but it's not that that's not the case in every uh, death penalty case. And so, you know, I do know that there have been death penalty cases that that weren't that cut and dry. I and mean, there is like a gray area. So, you know, I and I understand that people need to re research that. And, and that's fine. You know, if, if you want to research it. But I know that in my case, that it was the ultimate punishment. And so I definitely believe that the death penalty was the best option for my attacker. Near the end of the book, you wrote about your decision to forgive your attacker. Holly, that chapter was so powerful and so jaw dropping that I had to read it twice. Can you explain to our viewers why forgiveness was so important? Well, I think that anybody that has had a wrong done to them probably understands how powerful forgiveness can be. Forgiveness is not for the person who did the wrong to you. Forgiveness is for you to be able to, I guess, be able to deal with what happened. And, you know, it, it's really hard to do. Forgiveness is not an easy thing to do, but it's powerful. And when you can accomplish it, 
you and it again it, it again helps to lose the power over you that it has over you so i mean it's it's not just that it it's not just for you and your healing it's it's for you and the power that that story has over you and and forgiveness really is in your control and you know i really think that when something terrible happens when you've had someone do something terrible to you you want to take all control and power back that's the number one thing you want is the, the ultimate power was taken away from you so you want that power back and a power that you have is forgiveness and i just i think it's it's very powerful and it's it's healing i think that's such an important point that you just made and i hope it resonates with people who need to hear it when you look back at the ordeal that you endured are there times when you find it hard to believe that you had the strength and the resilience to survive and to heal as well as you have well you know it wasn't perfect I mean, you know, I know that, that my healing process wasn't always perfect, but you know, I, I don't look back and think, how did I do that? I look back and think how amazing it is that I was able to do that. And, and, and that also, I think helps me in my faith to know that, that, you know, my strength came from my faith and my strength came from my family. You know, I have, I am my father's daughter. And, you know, if there is a, a person of resilience in this world, it is my father. So, you know, I, I just feel, I feel proud more than anything. I mean, I don't look back and think, you know, how amazing was that, that you were able to do it. I just look back and think you were, you are now empowered and you, you know, you could get through it again if you had to. I always say I wouldn't wish this on anyone. I don't want anybody to join the this sisterhood or this this you know brotherhood any anything of I don't want anyone to join this survivor of a serial killer. This is not what I wish on anyone. But you know my life is completely changed by this. I mean my whole direction and my work and who I help and what I do was completely changed by this thing that happened in my life. And, you know, I'm so thankful for it. I, I wouldn't be here if that hadn't happened. And, you know, if there's one thing I could change, it would be that Chris would still be here. I do wish that he was still here and still in the world. That's the, and, and all the victims that, that my attacker, you know, killed all his, all his victims. I just wish that everybody could be in the world still. Um, but I do, I, I want to live my life and make, make sure that they're all remembered and make sure that, you know, I can, they would be proud of me if they, if they were here today. Oh, I know they would be. And I, I just wish that your attacker had been caught after the first attack, but it wasn't meant to be. Uh, I want to mention to our viewers that you've received the U.S. Department of Justice Award and the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Award for Public Service and an honorary doctorate from Oakland City University. And people can follow all your activities on your website, hollykdunn.com. Well, Holly, I'm so grateful that you took the time to come on our show and share your amazing story with our viewers. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. Your book is a must read, and it's one of those books that stays with the reader long after you've finished reading it. I wish you and your husband and children all the very best of good health and happiness because nobody deserves it more than you, Holly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harvey. Our guest has been Holly K. Dunn, author of Soul Survivor. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.